pleasure to welcome you to our church online here at Hamilton Baptist. Good morning everyone and welcome to Hamilton Baptist Church Online. My name is Andrew, I'm part of the, the worship team here at Hamilton and it's such a, a pleasure to, to welcome you this morning. Jonathan Davey will be bringing God's word to us later on today, so thanks Jonathan for, for doing that. And we're going to open by singing two brilliant worship songs. First one, Goodness of God. A brilliant song that um, the first verse says, I love you Lord, your mercy never fails me. All my days have been held in your hand. Brilliant words of truth that we find in Jesus. And then we'll be joined by some of the rest of the team to sing How Great Thou Art, a song that I'm sure many of us know um, and love so much. I just want to, to leave you with a, a Bible verse before we begin our, our worship. And it's from Psalm 145, verse 9. It said, The Lord is good to all and his tender mercies are over all his works. Hope you enjoy your worship today, everyone. Thanks. I love you. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. Now I give you everything. 
Joy. 
to see you all. Today we're going to be looking at a very special word and it's the word listen. I wonder what you like to listen to. Master Chef is back searching for the country's best amateur cooks. Hello. Hello, friend. How are you? Hey, George Adams sees the gap. Come on, he's come on, come on, he's got run, support from run. Chris Williams. Oh, and Chris Williams In today's story, we're going to learn about a time when God told the disciples something that they had to listen to. Let's have a look at the story. The disciples had seen Jesus do many miracles. He'd healed a man who couldn't walk. He'd made a dead girl come back to life. He'd fed thousands of people with just a few fish and loaves of bread. And he even walked on water. Jesus was able to do some amazing things. One evening, some of the disciples were about to learn something even more amazing about Jesus. They were going to learn what God thought about Jesus. In fact, they were going to see what God thought of Jesus. Let's have a look at the story. Jesus asked Peter, James and John to follow him up onto a mountain to pray. Even though the disciples were very sleepy, they followed him just as he had asked. Suddenly, as they were walking, Jesus began to change right in front of their eyes. Everything came so bright. Jesus' face began to shine brighter than the sun. His clothes became lighter than any colour we've ever seen. Then, next to Jesus, two other men from the Old Testament appeared. One was Moses and the other was Elijah. Peter, James and John could hardly believe their eyes. They didn't know how this was possible. Moses and Elijah had died a long time ago and now they're standing next to Jesus. And they were having a conversation with Jesus. They were talking about how he was going to die. Soon, Moses and Elijah started to leave, but Peter tried to stop them. He said, please, Lord, wait. I want to build three nice shelters so that you can stay with us. But while Peter was speaking to them, a bright cloud came down and covered them all. Whoa. Then everyone heard a voice. This was not a voice they'd ever heard before. This was the voice of God. God said, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. The disciples were so afraid at hearing the voice of God that they fell down on the ground. They fell flat on their faces. Jesus told them to get up and he told them not to be afraid. When the disciples finally looked up, everything was back to normal and Jesus was standing there alone. Now they knew that Jesus was even more special, special than they'd thought before. He was the Son of God. The disciples knew that they should always do what God said and listen to the words of Jesus. Isn't that an amazing true story? It reminds us of the goodness of God. Goodness in that he sent Jesus to earth to save us. And it also reminds us that we need to have listening ears. We need to listen to what Jesus is saying to us in our lives. I don't know about you, but I do a lot of talking and not a lot of listening. But we're told to stop, rest, listen. Listen to what God is saying. Let's pray. Dear God, 
We thank you that even during this time of lockdown, we have been able to continue to connect and support our church family through the church live stream, Zoom calls and prayer. Thank you that even though we may be physically distanced from each other, that nothing can separate us from your love, and that is what holds us together. Help us as a church to respond to this virus with faith and not fear. As a father has compassion on his children, so you have compassion on us. So we pray for protection over the most vulnerable in our communities, who are scared and lonely and feel like there is no escape. Shield and cover them in the gentle way only you can. Help us to be mindful of the effects of our actions on others by following medical advice and being responsible when buying supplies. We pray for our country. You know we have all been affected by COVID-19 in different personal ways. Help those in our country who don't know you to recognise their weakness without you and to see the hope that can only be found in you. There is a lot of pain, injustice and suffering in our world right now, but you say in John 13 verse 7, What I am doing now you do not understand, but afterward you will understand. When it's hard for us to understand your ways, help us to trust your heart. Thank you that you hold the whole world in your hands and underneath everything are your everlasting arms. Help us to rest in that. In Jesus' name, Amen. Good morning. Today we're reading from 1 Timothy chapter 5 and I'm reading in the ESV version entitled Instructions for the Church. Do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father, younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters, in all purity. Honour widows who are truly widows, but if a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household and to make some return to their parents, for this is pleasing in the sight of God. She who is truly a widow, left all alone, has set her hope on God and continues in supplications and prayers day and night. But she who is self-indulgent is dead even while she lives. Command these things as well so that they may be without reproach. But if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his own household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Let a widow be enrolled if she is not less than 60 years of age, having been the wife of one husband and having a good reputation for good works. If she has brought up children, has shown hospitality, has washed the feet of the saints, has cared for the afflicted, and has devoted herself to every good work. But refuse to enrol younger widows, for when their passions draw them away from Christ, they desire to marry, and so incur condemnation for having abandoned their former faith. Besides that, they learn to be idlers, going about from house to house, and not only idlers, but also gossips and busybodies saying what they should not. So, I would have younger widows marry, bear children, manage their households, and give the adversary no occasion for slander. For some have already strayed up after Satan. If any believing woman has relatives who are widows, let her care for them. Let the church not be burdened so that it may care for those who are truly widows. Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honour, especially those who labour in preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain, and the labourer deserves his wages. Do not admit a charge against an elder, except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. As for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all, so that the rest may stand in fear. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of the elect angels, I charge you to keep these rules without prejudging, doing nothing from partiality. 
Do not be hasty in the laying on of hands, nor take part in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. No longer drink only water, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. The sins of some people are conspicuous, going before them to judgment, but the sins of others appear later. So, also good works are conspicuous, and even those that are not cannot remain hidden. Good morning, church family. It's fantastic to welcome you to our service today on Sunday the 21st of June. Thank you to my wonderful wife Victoria for reading our passage, 1 Timothy chapter 5. I hope you've been as encouraged and challenged as I have in these last few weeks uh, in the nine different messages that we've been brought in this book of 1 Timothy. Do you know the words of Isaiah 55 11 have really come alive to me in this time of lockdown. It simply reads, my word be that goes from my mouth, it shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose. I don't know about you, but as we've opened to some of these passages in 1 Timothy, you think, how on earth does this apply to my life? What does this mean for me in lockdown? But you know, every single week as the, the God's word has been taught with clarity, I feel I have learnt something, I feel I have grown, I feel I have been greatly challenged and the spirit has been at work with me. I hope you have too. This may seem like a strange book for us to explore at this time, but I think it's been greatly helpful for us to consider the order of church, the organisation of church, our response to our leaders, our response to problems in the church. So what we're going to do this morning is open 1 Timothy chapter 5, next week we're going to open chapter 6. Now obviously I'm not going to get through all 25 verses of this in complete detail, so there's three things that I really want to point out for us this morning. And I've entitled this sermon, We Should Encourage, Love and Honour All Members of God's Family. And we find the first point of encouragement in verses 1 and 2 that simply reads, Do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father. Younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, and younger women in all, as sisters in all purity. Do you know, I hope this is a mark of Hamilton Baptist Church. This is the sort of family atmosphere that every church of Jesus Christ should look to create. I would love to think that this sort of atmosphere, this encouragement, this building up of one another oozes from our church. That everybody who enters through our doors, whether they have been part of our church for 50 or 60 years, or whether they've just walked in, is treated with love, respect, encouragement and care. Because at the end of the day, as God's family, we're stuck with each other here on earth. This is the family that God has given us, that he has adopted us into. This really balances out the authority that that Timothy has given, as Paul alludes to in 1 Timothy 4.12. And what he's doing here is telling him not to abuse his authorities. We can probably think of far too many pastors and churches who have ruined churches, who have ruined themselves, have destroyed churches because of their abuse of authority. So what Paul's seeking to do here as he writes this is to set out something of how Timothy should interact. I wonder if you can think back to your younger years, to your relationship with your dad or with maybe a a male role model in your life. There are certain lines in that relationship with that older man, with somebody that we greatly respect, that should not be crossed. And I think even now, my dad and I can disagree on many, many different things, but I have a respect and I have an honour for him because he's my dad. And that respect and that honour that we have, though we can disagree, is what as younger men we are called to hold to, to those who are older. I don't have a brother, but I have a younger sister. And when I think back to the conversations we had in our childhood, from her to me, most of those conversations revolve around stop it, grow up, or let's go and play. But in all seriousness, there is a love between brothers. 
There is a love between brothers. There is a disciplining love between brothers. There is a keeping right between brothers. And we always look out for our siblings. We'll always care for them, no matter the distance or the contact that may be limited between us. There is a care that is there between siblings. And likewise, women, younger women and girls are to look up to older women as mothers with that love and that respect and that desire to learn from them. And older women are to love and protect the younger like siblings. And we see these words older and younger and I don't necessarily think this is entirely an age thing but it is also a spiritual maturity thing. I'm sure we can all think of people we know that just ooze godliness and spiritual maturity. Treat them as fathers in the sense, be a sponge and just absorb everything that they would say. Listen to them, pay attention to them because they are worth listening to. As Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 11, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. This, at first glance, may seem an arrogant statement, but it's not. Because this is a man that understood his relationship with Christ and his spiritual maturity. Because Paul's life was marked by his pursuit of Jesus. And because of that, he was worth listening to. Now this doesn't set out a a rule for us in verse 1 and 2. This isn't a rule that says, Timothy, you're a younger man, therefore you should never rebuke or tell off or set straight an older man. But what it does say is that it must come from a place of love and encouragement. Yes, there are maybe situations or conversations that would be best coming from someone who is older. Maybe in an age dynamic there are conversations that are not right coming from somebody that is younger. But uh, Timothy, as a young pastor, will have to rebuke in the church at times. And Paul isn't telling him to back down from that. But there must be a genuine love and a genuine care for God's people. It's unacceptable for anybody, not just the younger man, to, to rebuke or to admonish anybody without genuine love and affection. He will have to rebuke. That's what we read in 1 Timothy chapter 6 of these wealthy people that were not using their resources correctly and there was a conversation to be had there from Timothy. Timothy was to go and have that awkward conversation. And the final three words just in these two verses, in all purity. I think these words are are talking of the dynamic of a young pastor and younger women. He's focusing on that relationship dynamic there. What is the relationship between a young pastor and younger women to be? It is to be one that is pure. In Titus 2, uh, Paul also instructs that uh, older men are to train younger men, older women to train younger women. Improper interest and intimacy must be avoided at all costs. One thing we put in place to ensure that is pastors should not meet one-on-one with younger women. This is very simply, and we know exactly why Paul has called us to this. Wisdom says, do you know what? I don't think that is sensible. Younger women are to learn from the wisdom of the older women. Of course, that doesn't mean we don't learn from each other, because of course we do. We together are the priesthood of believers. We are all God's people, and we all have something to share with and teach one another. But there is a special dynamic, there is a special relationship between the older and the younger women. And I think these first two verses, if churches paid close attention to this, I could think of many situations that could be avoided in churches. Are you encouraging those older than you, more mature in the faith, as you would encourage your own parents? Who are you encouraging in their walk with the Lord? And those of you who are older, more wise in the faith, Who are you imparting your wisdom to? Who are you encouraging and who are you loving? Our own families deserve respect and so does the family of God. So let us as Hamilton Baptist Church, as a family, as a community of believers, be a family that are marked by our encouragement and our love for one another. 
you know, this week I, I set our older teenagers a challenge as we were thinking about uh, encouragement, uh, love is encouragement. We I set this challenge. Can you think of a time when somebody has greatly encouraged you in your Christian walk? It may be a couple of weeks ago, it may be 50 years ago, it doesn't matter. But it was a moment that meant something to you. Maybe it was somebody giving you something, maybe it was somebody sharing a verse with you, maybe it was just somebody sharing time with you when you were going through a difficult phase. What I'd like you to do is think of that moment and I'd love it if you would share that moment with the person that encouraged you because that will help them, that will encourage them greatly to know that something that they have done has encouraged you. So turn that encouragement that you've received and encourage another believer with it. That's just a little side challenge for you from this morning. Who has encouraged you in your Christian walk and have you told them? If not, go and do it. Verses 3 to 16, love the vulnerable. This is where I want to focus most of our time this morning. God is glorified when families care for their members and when churches care for the widows in distress. When there is no family around, it is the church that God uses to provide for the vulnerable in their midst. The job of the church, as is set out here for Timothy, is to care for the widows as their own mother. The church of God is the family that cares for one another. She is to be given honour rather than to f- that rather than forced to beg and scrape by in poverty. And we find the, these two words that we read, true widows, in verses 3 and 16. And it asks the question, who is a true widow? And in this context, the true widow is the one who is completely dependent upon God. We must remember we are looking at a time where there were no social services, no pensions, no life insurance, nowhere to go for help, no one to support them outside of their own family, no source of income at all. And this subject may look at a slight arm's length for us. Yes, there are widows in our midst and we acknowledge the struggles and the grief and the pain that they face and we are not removed from that issue. But this is not a manual for us as Hamilton Baptist Church in 2020 and how to deal with widows. Interestingly, the creation of deacons in Acts chapter 6 was set up to support deacons. It was set up to support widows because the widows were being neglected. And it is most important that the church look after its own. Seven men were appointed as deacons to do the physical work and see out the distribution of bread. Why? Why should we love the vulnerable? Why should we care? I think we find this gloriously put in James chapter 1, 27. And it says this, what is good? What is pure religion? It says, religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. And in the words of Alistair Begg, this is practical godliness expressed. This is who we, friends, are called to be. A people that are so in love with Jesus, that are so concerned with this parental, a sibling love, of our senior or of those younger than us, that we want to make sure everybody in our midst is looked after and cared for. And there are principles for us to pull out of this that are helpful for us in our context, in our time. There are helpful things in this verse, in these verses that talk about organisation and pastoral care and wisdom. And it's great that we see here this robust framework that is being put in in the church of Ephesus. We're not to act blindly in the way that we care for one another. But the reason he has to do that, the reason this must be put in place, is because there are those that seek to milk the church. There are those that seek to take when they do not need. The true widows in verses 3 and 16 are those with great material need. But what we see in verse 5 is that this genuine poverty drove some of these widows to exemplary lives of prayer 
of fasting and of worship. And what I want to do is I just want to spend a little time looking at a great example of an exceptionally godly widow that we find in Luke chapter 2 verses 36 to 38. We read the story of Anna. And it reads, And there was a prophetess Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin, and then as a widow until she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshipping with fasting and prayer day and night. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. We don't know a huge amount else about Anna. But we do know that she had nothing and that she was a widow. She wouldn't have had a home to call her own. And it's safe to assume that she had very little material possession. And as far as society went, she was the lowest of the low. In society's eyes, there was no great value at all to Anna. Her value then was in her husband. So she just spent her years withering away and she'll pass on and that'll be her. But we read in these incredible verses that this 84-year-old woman did not depart from the temple, was worshipping with fasting and prayer night and day and proclaiming who the Messiah was to come. Do you know what great grief and tragedy Anna knew? How deep the pain and the loss that she must have known. And I think for all of us, no matter where we find ourselves this morning, there is something of Anna's story that we can relate to. And it very simply is this question of what is our response to hardship? What is our response to suffering, to grief, to struggle, to isolation, to loneliness? And I look at this and I read of this woman Anna and I think I want to be like Anna. I want my reaction to be that of Anna. A reaction that says, no matter what I face, I'm going to worship my God. I'm going to praise my God. I'm going to pray. I'm going to fast. I'm going to give everything that I am of the little that I have to God. Anna was utterly dependent upon God. And that's the wider picture that we see here in 1 Timothy 5. These true widows that are utterly dependent upon God. You know, I imagine them coming together and singing words of Psalm 121. I lift my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. The words of Proverbs 3, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways submit to him and he will make your path straight the glorious words in exodus 15 the lord is my strength and my song and he has come become my salvation this is my god and i will praise him i will exalt him here we have a woman who has physically nothing who is in a place where she has experienced great loss and great grief but her eyes are so firmly fixed upon Jesus. Friends, wherever we are this morning, would that something of Anna's story resonate with us? Would that be us? Whatever we find ourselves, whatever the hardship we face, would our eyes be so transfixed upon Jesus and his beauty? Would we declare his splendor, his righteousness, his goodness and his mercy? Because God is good and God is so worthy of our praise. But as we come to verse 6, we see the opposite of this. But she who is self-indulgent is dead, even when she lives. We don't need to go into great detail of the self-indulgent lifestyle of a widow. We read further down of the gossiping and the things that go on in there that shouldn't go on. But there are some who will go through that struggle, that grief, hardship, and they will turn their back on God and look to the things of this world. Seeking earthly pleasures to undoubtedly fill this void that has been left inside them. And very simply, my reflection upon that this morning is where is our dependency? Do we want to be true widows who are so fixed upon Jesus? Or do we want to be those 
that in the trial and the grief and the hardship turn our backs upon God. Do you know, I was one of these teenagers, I didn't go to church for a couple of years when I was 16, 17, and I thought, do you know what, I just want to have a good time. I will come back to God one day, but I want to have a good time. Like, I'll be a Christian one day, if I have kids, I'll take them to church, all that sort of stuff. But just now, I, w- I want to go and have fun, and then I can do the boring bit later on. Little did I know that God would bring me back long before I would have intended to come back. But this is the attitude of many. I will get serious with God one day. I'll get myself on track one day. Yeah, I'm sure that there is a God, and I'm sure he's kind of important somehow, but I've got lots of my life to worry about that. But I think if this pandemic has shown us anything, it has shown us the frailty of life. And I don't want to be all doom and gloom this morning, but I urge you to consider where is your dependency? Because for all you know, tomorrow may not come for you. My urge to you is to build your life upon the rock of ages. It's to worship the God who is the same yesterday, today and forevermore. It's to worship the Messiah, to come before the Messiah who hung on that cross because he loves you so much and wants relationship and to know you and to pull you from the depths of your sins. And it is his spirit that continues to work in you, transforming you into the promise, into the life of Christ Jesus. There is the offer from God. Or we have the things of the flesh, the things of death, as we're told. The things of this world, the things that are not of God. Do we want to be self-indulgent? Do we want to give in to the desires of our heart that ultimately separate us from God? There's a decision for all of us to make and if we want to be like Anna, would that be our prayer? Would would we just be people that make that time, that worship and praise? To summarise kind of verses 7 to 16, what we see here is just something of that organisation. Know who you're helping and why you're helping them. Don't help those who don't need help. Don't help those who are trying to scam you out of help. We read of those that are less than 60. Again, I don't think the 60 is, is a benchmark, but it's more a round number that would reflect the expectations of when it would be too old in the culture to get remarried. And we also read in verse 9, the wife of one husband, a difficult translation. And I don't think that reflects something of a woman who has uh, been widowed before and remarried. I don't think that's what it means. But because sexual immorality was so rife in this culture, I think that's what it was talking of. More of polygamy, more of making sure that she has one man and not multiple men. And a third point that we find in verses 17 to 25 on our our leaders a pastor an elder who teaches and rules well in preaching and teaching God's word is worthy to receive honor that's essentially what Paul is saying here and he calls it double honor and I don't think by double honour he means give him double the amount of honour that you would give anybody else in the church. But I think it's more of a twofold honour. It's one that gives respect and authority. And it is one that financially pays well. And whilst the payment of elders isn't expected in every situation, the, these verses reflect something of how the church's attitude should be towards paying elders. Do you know, as a pastor spends hours in God's word, preparing sermon after sermon, Bible studies, praying for every member of the congregation, the responsibilities and the pressures of ministries. It is not feasible for a pastor who is working full-time hours to go out and work a full-time job on top of that to support themselves. And it doesn't bring God glory for a minister to come begging and living in poverty to serve the local body. So Paul's encouraging that here, that there would be some level of pay. And I think that it is something like, the pastor cares for you, so you should care for them. I think Hebrews 13, 17 sets out for us. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your soul, as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Our leaders should lead with joy, 
not groaning. We don't need that. And it's a good challenge for me. Have joy, don't groan. And we come and, and, and he brings in something of if you need to rebuke an elder. There's so much going on in this passage. Um, but briefly, those three verses, do we not admit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or three witnesses? As for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all so that the rest may stand in fear. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of the elect angel, angels, I charge you to keep these rules without prejudging, doing nothing from partiality. Here Paul is setting out for us how to discipline elders. It is a process, as church discipline is, a process of restoration. And the main point he's getting to here and the reason he's talking about witnesses is it should be based on facts and not rumours. I'm sure we can all think of situations where things have become divided, where relationships have been torn apart because of vicious uh, rumours. Whether it be somebody who is a bully or wants to take control, many of them on biblical accusations. This is why it is best for two or three who have the same concern to come and take it. It keeps the accuser in the right, it keeps the church in the right, and it does things in a way that honours God. And I think the reference to the elect angels is probably drawing on this image of the heavenly courts. And it should be public so that others may fear the consequences. This is something that should be done in the open, not something in the back room of the church. And it is done, as he ends that, without favouritism. Verse 22 tells us, don't be hasty in the laying on of hands, nor take part in the sins of others. Keep yourselves pure. Do not be hasty to call elders. The church should take time in calling its elders. Take time, make sure that those men are above reproach and stay pure. And I want to just leave us with that thought as we as a church are in this process of looking for our new senior pastor. It is not for us to be hasty. It is not for us to rush. At the moment we do not know who the man will be that will be called into the life of Hamilton Baptist Church. But we pray that God is working in his heart and our hearts to draw us and lead us to the under shepherd that will come. So please continue to pray. Continue to pray for our search committee. Continue to pray for the man that will be our next pastor. We don't know who he will be, but God most certainly does. I want to leave you with these three questions. Well, kind of, technically four. How are we relate relating to each of these three groups that Paul highlights? Are you encouraging your church family? Whether you are the youngest or the oldest member of Hamilton Baptist Church or the surrounding family, how are you encouraging others? I have loved hearing lockdown stories. I have loved hearing stories of all the things people are doing to encourage one another, from the number of phone calls that are going, from surprises, all sorts of stuff. People are looking after and looking out for one another. And I love that because that's what a family does. Are you caring for those who cannot care for themselves? Are, are we as a church looking after those that need that care? And are we honouring our church leaders? Are we honouring and respect them with the respect that Paul calls us to here? And I guess on top of that, within the second point, are we like Anna? Are we people who are so utterly dependent upon God? that everything else pales into insignificance, no matter where we find ourselves. And with that, I just want to leave you with a little challenge. If you've not treated somebody as you should have, a brother, a sister, a father, a mother, and it's burdening you right now, I urge you to go to the person individually and ask for forgiveness. That is a big and a brave and a scary thing to do. But would we take this week and take this opportunity to get ourselves right with each other, to get ourselves right with God, all for his glory? There's your challenge for this week. Shall we come and shall we pray?
Our Lord and our God, would we be people who are so utterly dependent upon you that our hearts of love, our hearts of encouragement, our hearts of humility and care and encouragement, would they just flow from us? Would we be so dedicated to becoming more and more like the image of Christ? Would your spirit continue to work in each one of us? Lord, for those of us that need to know a little something of who you are today, would you just wash us afresh, we pray. Would we know something of your marvellous and wonderful spirit working in our midst? Father, with all of these things we come before you, we ask, we thank you that you are the great God. We thank you that you are the God that laid his life down for your people. And we pray that as we continue in this time, as we continue in this time of, of restriction, would you keep our motivation high? Would you keep our hearts focused on you? In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks very much, folks. Sings my soul.